Hello, my name is Howard Corbett. Today we're going to talk to you about building a performance culture. We're going to talk about what, what matters, how you do it, and the big opportunity to get gains in performance within your organization. The objectives really that we want to cover is we are going to introduce you to our 5D framework, which is a whole structure for making this stuff happen easier and better. We're going to describe how it accelerates performance and how it increases prevent competitive advantage. Hopefully, as a result of this introduction, you will be able to arm yourself with enough information so you can actually go back in your organization and look at some changes in your business strategy, and then maybe there might be an opportunity for a relationship with us that would lead to a successful partnership. Our mission as an organization is we focus on helping leaders create exceptional organizations that create value for society. We do this really with a very, very tight partnership we help you develop strategies, we help you get the activities implemented that are necessary for performance. And our focus is really on extending your capability to create and execute innovative transformation. So it's about you, it's about your capability, it's about it expanding. And we've really created a way that is simple and accelerates your path to results. What we're looking at is a better approach to organizational performance, just like the high jump where there was the scissors and then the western roll and then the straddle and the Fosbury flop and each one of those methods achieved a higher level of performance and the old me method really left you at a competitive disadvantage. The world is changing very fast for business these days and organizations are looking for ways to approach the marketplace in a way that really makes you more competitive than you could have been with the way that you did yesterday. So this relevance in the marketplace and the challenge of how do we stay relevant really is about getting better faster. In the same way that there was a new method for jumping the high jump, getting better faster really is what's the next method, what's the next approach, how can we do this in a way that we actually are getting better faster. And it's really a very, very broad concern about the organization. <clears throat> so if you look at your competition, and the, most people that are running organizations are worried about the competition, they have a certain pace at which they improve things. And what we want to help you do is get your pace ahead of your competitions, which creates a competitive advantage. So how do we do this? What's the focus? Three things that allow you to get better faster are identifying and solving the right problems and doing it faster, which is change acceleration. Second one is developing your people faster, which is a competency acceleration. And the third is improving products and services faster, which is innovation acceleration. We have found there are several things that really matter when it comes to if you're trying to accelerate performance of an organization. The first one that is really, really important is organizational health, and we believe it's an essential foundation for performance advantage. We will be talking about that in some detail. Adaptability is really trying to achieve a balance between a steady state, which needs to execute over and over again things that you do repeatedly, and adaptability, which is the future state, is how do we put in place things that we haven't been able to do in the past, something new and get it in place. So that tension, that yin-yang tension between stable and adaptability. We talk about ownership because we think it is one level above engagement. It's when your employees really own the success of the company. They are grabbing a hold of the challenges and tackling like it was at the center of their own purpose, what they're trying to accomplish. What it's at, they've grabbed a hold of this with all their hearts as it were. So employees owning your challenges and tackling them with an aggressiveness. Then there's collective intelligence. Can you put people together in groups and have them become far more intelligent than they are individually? A lot of times you put them together and they become less intelligent. But you want to be able to have teams of people engaging in challenges and becoming far more intelligent than they are just operating by themselves. And together that creates your development pace. It's figuring out the structures and the systems for how to get better in a way that really works for you. So those are sort of the five things that we think really matter in an initiative where you're trying to develop an increased pace of transformation. Why is organizational health uh, uh, really essential? Uh, there was a study done by John Cotter and James Heskett where they studied 200 companies over 11 years. And the chart that you see is comparing low health cultures and high health cultures. And it compares the revenue growth the employment growth, the stock price growth, and the net income growth. And if you can see in the red, the, the red is the healthy cultures, the blue is the unhealthy. 
there is a substantial difference in growth and performance of companies that have strong health. And so we believe that is a foundation to creating performance. And you might ask, well, what is health? What does it look like? Well, the bottom of this pyramid is really low health and the top of the pyramid is high health. The low health would be where people are passive, they're sort of obedient, but it takes a stick to get them moving. Uh, a little bit better performance is if people are working hard and it's like the carrot they got in centers we're working hard to make this task get done better, quicker. But a higher level of engagement would be people are thinking and taking on challenges and not just doing what they're told. Uh, beyond that, you end up people initiating, seeing things and, and, and on their own initiative, making changes and, and working together. Uh, at a higher level, you've got innovation happening where people are looking to find new ways and better ways of doing things. And the top of the organizational health pyramid is really where a vision driven, where you have a vision driven ownership, where you've got passion and zeal and that's driving performance within the organization. So as you can see, if you compare a group of employees that were dominantly passive to ones that were dominantly vision driven, you would have a very significant difference in the performance of the organization. I'd like you to think right now a little bit about what keeps you up at night. What are the challenges you have that you would really like to see solved? And think about those in terms of uh, what they are specifically. And as we go through these slides, take those issues that are top of mind and maybe ask yourself the question, could what we're talking about address those things? And what we have found when we're talking with CEOs is if you have a good discussion about what's keeping them up at night, these systems and methods really do make a difference and you can resolve issues that are very hard to resolve otherwise. Three types of challenges that organizations have. You have the organization that's in decline and one of the challenges of the CEO is to actually take those people that organization get your people to wake up and say we can't stay the same we can't be continuing in the decline and sort of to light a fire and say it's time guys to rally around making this a better company we cannot continue in the state of decline there are other organizations very different where they're just performing fine and they're in sort of a steady state but perform they're not declining but they're not getting better and that is in my mind it's a crisis too because not getting better is over time becomes uh, your competition is getting better and over time it really becomes a challenge. So you've got to light a fire and say we can't just continue on the way we are because we're going to become obsolete. The other challenge that a lot of people don't think about as a challenge is the whole idea where you've been growing like crazy and you've got uh, the world by the tail and you're running around and just busy, busy, busy. Well, a lot of times that busyness means you're not building the organization to handle growth. And there is a challenge. We can't just grow and not develop ourselves and not develop the talent to handle the growth. So almost no matter where you are in decline, steady, state, or growth, the challenge is lighting a fire for getting better and changing the pace at which you get better to where it is significantly. This urgency for change, is it clear? Is it articulated? Who understands it? And who's involved in driving performance improvements into the organization? The other one is the need for change. It, it, is, it can be done in a way that creates fear, which drives creativity out of your people. It can be done in a way that creates hope and say, hey, if we work together, we can really accomplish something here. High performance organizations need to be driven on hope, not on fear. We believe that getting better for the most part is an ignored discipline within organizations. If you can see on the chart here, you've got sort of the daily grind, the urgent, the busy work, getting the, the stuff out the door, doing what you've got to do to make the business succeed. And there's a small part of your time that you've got for getting better. That is what we focus on, is that small amount of time for getting better, organization-wide, how well is it organized, how is it coordinated, how many things can you do in parallel, can you get more parallel activities happening and get more of that limited time that you've got. And that's really what we help organizations structure. And that's what we're going to show you with the 5D framework, is how it accelerates the getting better disciplines within the organization. So how do you get there? First of all, you need to build a culture, and which it easily taps into the ideas and expertise of your people. You need to create an environment where it's safe for people to offer and share their ideas and they feel like it's not a dangerous thing, even if they may seem crazy. And you need to develop the systems and structures that deploy an army of your people on innovative, really as innovative contributors. Multiple parallel development efforts really determines your pace of change and how do you organize yourself so that can happen. Ultimately, if you can get to the highest level, to a very high level of acceleration, 
you're going to start to do disruptive innovation, which means you're causing great pain for your competition. Your people will not feel free to contribute their ideas in a way that creates disruptive innovation unless they have the courage to dare greatly. This is really about stepping out into uncharted territory and it's very, it takes a lot of courage to get into that space. Daring greatly only happens in cultures that welcome reward and develop this type of behavior and so what we're going to be talking about is how do you do that. And that's where we've developed this 5D framework which has got five dimensions to it. Uh, we call them getting ready, uh, mobilizing for change, facilitating for measurable results, developing the change execution disciplines, and developing leaders of change. And I'm going to walk you through these five elements. They all need to be working sort of at the same time, but we use this, we really believe it's a proven system to simplify and accelerate your results, and it really does work. So let's have a look at it, just briefly, um, on the five things. Getting ready really is about accurately identifying the drivers for change and the resistors that will sabotage change. Um, Mobilizing for change is about unleashing an army to drive change initiatives. How do you get lots of people involved in parallel driving improvements into the organization? Uh, facilitating for measurable results. If I'm going to mobilize a lot of people for change, what you really need to be able to do is put them in teams and use facilitation so that they go about doing what you want them to do in a way that's far better than what they know how to do because you facilitated it. Facilitation is a very, very significant enabler that allows you to deploy multiple teams and it also enables significant culture shift. As these teams are implementing change or they're designing change and they're understanding the real challenges, they need to lead change and typically most of these teams are leading change across the organization and a lot of the people have departmental skills on making change but they don't have organization-wide skills. So you've got to be able to really backfill them with the skills and processes and structures for leading large-scale change, organization-wide change, an essential ingredient. And if you don't address this well, everything else that you do, all the design, all the redesign starts to fall apart. We find this is where the ball gets dropped a lot of times. And then finally, as you start to accelerate what you need to build uh, into your leadership team, and leadership really needs to happen throughout the organization, is to uncover and build the people that lead change more effectively. So you want to increase the leadership talent in the organization on multiple levels. And if you do this right, you're going to uncover and find leaders uh, and, and deploy a, a quantity of leadership within your organization significantly beyond what uh, has historically been happening. So let's go back to these and look at them just in a little bit more in detail, getting ready, identifying the drivers for change. We use a couple of things. We use diagnostic survey and interviews, and what we're looking for is the motivators that uh, are in the company, that are in your people, and why, why they want change. And we found that if you can uncover the reasons they want change and tie it together with the reasons you want change, you can reduce and almost eliminate resistance to change. We want to identify the dead horse in the room. Whenever you start to say, let's get better and let's start to really um, address our pace of change and, and, and improve the company, you hierarchies typically create dead horses. They create things that people don't all know about but don't talk about. And unless you identify the dead horse and actually start to be able to talk about it, your change strategy and your improvement strategies are all walking around the dead horse and uh, not a good thing. We want to get candid conversations, the ability to talk about the things that we haven't been talking about. We want to develop common, shared burning platforms. We want to be able to understand the heart of your people and where they want change. And they see things, for the most part, that they really want to see addressed. Problems that they're experiencing over and over again. And there are these common, shared concerns that can be easily become a burning platform saying, we cannot continue to be the way we are. And if, as a CEO, if you can tap into those things, you really are making your whole change effort uh, significantly easier. We want to instill a sense of vision for being better, and we want to shift the conversation from hornets to hornet nests. We want, instead of the stuff that's bothering everyone, what's causing it, and to get that type of conversation on the table. So the whole process of getting ready is slowing down to speed up. It's, it's getting these common concerns understood on the table and having that conversation that says we don't want to stay where we are, we want to get different and what is that vision that we're going to 
aim at and being different. And we want to identify challenges for teams as rallying points to get them engaged, get them involved, and address things that typically have been left unaddressed and should have been addressed. When we start talking about mobilizing for change, the goal here is to unleash an army of people to drive change initiatives. And what's really different in terms of the structures that we help you put in place is we talk to companies and try to help them understand the idea of a horizontal responsibility. We have hierarchies, and with hierarchies, we break up responsibilities so that there's, um, you know, there's the sales, and there's the marketing, and there's the manufacturing, and the finance, and they've all got their own disciplines. But there are things that need to change in a company that are organization-wide. And how do you lead organization-wide? Things like leadership, innovation, customer delight, organizational health. That's throughout the whole organization. Uh, if you're going to delight the customer, it goes everywhere from shipping to the sales order to the promises being made and so on. And these are what we think of as horizontal responsibilities or horizontal challenges. They're organization-wide and, and many departments need to change the way they work in order for, to get a substantial change. So you need a structure that can deal with these horizontal challenges and most organizations haven't created a great structure for doing that. What we've implemented in a number of companies has been this change lead, a structure for change leadership and a structure for the steady state production. So we don't try and get rid of the hierarchy, but we want to use it for what it's best for. But we introduced a dual operating structure that really enables accelerated change. And where we've started to do this with customers, there is significant acceleration of performance and change in the organization and buy into that process. There are three levels. There is the integration team, the top team, which involves people from several levels of the organization. And their job is to try and create the mandate for change and create the focus for change. There are strategic theme teams, and these are um, that are led by a team, but it's they are leading it over a period of uh, typically years because they need to understand it. They need to understand the root cause of why you have that challenge, figure it out, and then lead it over time. And then there are solution teams that the strategic theme teams are assigning to pieces of work that needs to get done. And we try to break the whole work down into small chunks of work that'll make a difference and create payoff on a fairly fast pace. I want to talk a little bit about this whole idea of facilitating for measurable results. We find that this is big uh, in terms of giving you control over change because if you're going to deploy this army of teams to address issues, uh, facilitation plays a very, very critical role. What the facilitation process does is it provides guidance so teams basically can perform without extensive training. You can take the teams, assign them a responsibility, and through facilitation they can follow a process that makes them effective. We have found if you assign this type of responsibility to teams, uh, even with senior executives involved, uh, a lot of times they will hit the wall because it is very, very different. We'll talk about that a, a little bit later. Just-in-time training is where people are given an assignment, they have work to do, and they are given training on how to approach it so they can be far more effective. What this does is it enables a very significant culture shift because as you are coaching and facilitating these teams, you're introducing a different culture, uh, the culture of thinking horizontally, thinking about the whole organization and not just your silo or your pod or your workspace, but worrying about the whole organization, which is a fairly significant culture shift. What this does is it translates empowerment and ownership into practical action within the company and it builds confidence that they're actually able to tackle something and do it because the facilitation process provides them with guidance and strength as they're successful that building of confidence really is, okay, we can tackle this. It's, it's neat to watch these teams just really become significantly more confident over time. One of the reasons we think facilitation is really critical is that the DNA of a future-focused, horizontally-focused team is entirely different than the DNA of a steady-state hierarchical team. This one is more team-driven, the other one is individual-driven. This is dominantly leadership without people that report to you. The other one is management with people that report to you. This one is you dominantly have influence without a lot of authority, where hierarchies dominantly have authority over that part of the business. Uh, this one deals with uh, forming alignment around issues. The other one just assumes alignment is there. And you've got this 
set of skills and, and a style of thinking that's new to most people. And so by facilitating teams to take on projects, you're able to infuse quite easily a totally different DNA into the way they work and have them by working differently accomplish significantly more. So facilitation enables you to deploy an army of teams getting significant results, but these teams have not had the skills that they are actually going to use and they can, they can do this pretty effectively. The other thing that you're trying to do with facilitation is you're trying to tap into the motivations of your people. And so um, there are four primary motivators that are internal and there are external motivators, but the motivators that are internal are things like autonomy, which, you know, it's like the fight for freedom. No one likes being a slave. And there is a level of autonomy that you can get to these teams says you've got to go and look at what is going on here. You need to understand what's really going on here and figure out a solution that meets the needs of the company. And they sort of have a level of autonomy and there's an approval process, but they're told to think and look at anything that makes sense. And that gives them a level of autonomy that significantly affects motivation. The idea that the teams, these strategic theme teams are going to take this area and master it over time is a big motivator. That you tie them to purpose of what we're trying to do is something bigger than just make money and you want to tap it into purpose. We want to create a work environment for so that this is a much more enjoyable place for everyone to work. And connectedness is a big thing where people really want to connect with each other and these teams give a chance for higher levels of collaboration, cooperation and connectedness to a higher purpose. So, let's talk about building change execution disciplines. How do you build the skills so that these teams actually are capable of executing change when the change is across the organization and they've never done it before? Well, the first thing you need to do is realize that whole organization change execution is really a new skill set for most employees. And this is something that's taught at the solution team level. This is the teams that are actually involved in uh, getting things done, making the changes, designing the changes. And we provide them with a structure for thinking about implementation, a series of steps and tools for analyzing the challenges and then designing solutions that include uh, getting buy-in from the departments that are going to be affected by it. The role of internal facilitators, one of the things we do is we work with your people to be able to facilitate the way we facilitate. When we first start, we're facilitating these teams, but as we, over time, what we're doing is training key people within your organization to become facilitators so on an ongoing basis, your teams can be effective and you can constantly be deploying more teams. But leaving your organization with people who know how to do this type of facilitation is very important. And that facilitation process is very, very focused on the change execution side of the equation. Another element about ensuring execution is that the theme teams, um, while the solution team is responsible to implement a change, the theme team is responsible to monitor it until it actually has become a steady state and has become something that is practiced by the hierarchy without intervention from the change side of the organization or the future state side of the organization. The, the final part about uh, building a change execution discipline is really that you need to have a simple structure for people to follow. If you're going to have lots of teams involved in doing change, you need a simple structure that they're going to follow to test it, pilot it, prove it, stabilize it. And that's what we teach. Uh, the final area that really is important is organizations change. A lot of times what they don't do is develop leadership in a way that's needed for the increased competence of the organization. And we've been doing for over 30 years uh, leadership development with executive teams and Fortune 500s. And we've developed a model that really is quite different. It's not just about putting on a classroom. It's about having, yes, some group learning, but then having some teams that actually have execution responsibilities. They have to work together on executing using the skills that have been taught. And you have some self-learning as well. When you put this together, you're actually able to accomplish a very, very significant uptake of what's being taught is actually getting learned and practiced. And we have a whole method for doing this, which we can drill down into in more detail, but it works. So leadership is developed really at all team levels through the facilitation process. We teach and enable empowerment. We say we want people empowered, but we facilitate and coach that to actually happen. 
and we develop internal change facilitators, which is part of making people become leaders. The change facilitation is about developing leaders. And we add a formal leadership development as needed, typically with the top team, maybe top couple of levels, depending on the size of the organization. But your leadership skills have to adjust to keep pace with and complement the whole structure of the, um, the dual operating structure. So that really is an overview of the 5D framework. It is a proven system. It makes things surprisingly simple. And it accomplishes results that most CEOs are wishing for. They wish that people would just be far more responsive to their leadership and getting done what you want to get done. This helps it happen.